Well, let's give him a great praise tonight. Come on. Come on, give him a mighty shout tonight. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. You work it for our good. We magnify and praise your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Do you love him tonight? Well, this is the day the Lord has made. And we will rejoice with a packed out house. And I don't know what the witches are doing tonight, and I don't know what the Satanists are doing tonight, but I know what the believers are doing tonight. They're lifting Jesus high. They're lifting Jesus high. Somebody give him a praise. If there was a Halloween where you were partying more than you were praising, I want you to give him a praise tonight. Give him the glory tonight. Give him this day that he has made. We will rejoice. Turn to somebody and say, we will rejoice and be glad in this day. Now show them how to do it. And if anybody on your aisle rejoices, you're under a biblical mandate to rejoice too. Because the Bible said rejoice with them that rejoice. Is anybody rejoicing around you? Join them. Praise the Lord. Turn to somebody and say, you can take your mask off in here tonight. Amen. Tell them that. Smile at them and tell them you're glad they... Tell them, tell them just say, man, uh, you know, I had that seat reserved for a praiser. Are you the right one? Just ask them. If I say hi day, I want you to say hallelujah. If I say thank you, I want you to say Jesus. We need to work. We need a Paul and Silas dynamic going. Try them out. Say praise the Lord. And they ought to say something back. We don't care if you're Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, one God, two God, three God. I, we, we left all those labels out in the parking lot. We're gathered under one name, Jesus. Come on and praise Jesus. This is not about you. This is about Jesus. This is not about a church. This is not about a revival. This is about Jesus. Get it right. Get it right. And if this is your first night, we're so honored you're here. We're so thankful you're here. But we're not here to impress you. We're not here to push a button and that's not what this is about. You, you have it wrong. We are here tonight to hear about him, to receive from him his word in power and demonstration. And it's, and it's burning like a fire in our souls again. And that's what revival does. So just turn to two or three people and Say, I'm glad you're here tonight, and I meant what I said. I want you to praise the Lord with me, all right? You may be seated. All of you in overflow, we're just so thankful. I can't, I, I had no idea what to expect. And choir, I have no idea where y'all gonna sit. Good luck. But you can sit on the thing, but that's very uncomfortable. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Tell our choir how much we appreciate them. They've been singing. A praise team. We got, we got them in shifts now, I think. We, we're having to, Perry's wearing out the praise team, and so we're having to call in. Uh, while some are getting oxygen and Gatorade on the side sideline, that we, new, new recruits are stepping up, and they're doing amazing. Doing ama I'm so proud of you last night. You blessed me. Some of us older folk need to get out of the way sometimes to let the younger people just show us how to do it. I love it. I love it. Praise the Lord. I want to show you a little angel. Come here. 
This is my this is my son Drake, his beautiful wife Jamie, and this is their baby, and and she is a little kitty cat tonight. <laughs> and all and I did this I did this just to mess up some of you religious people, make you mad. But we still believe in having a good time and having fun with our children and and, and judge me if you want to judge me, but uh, she'll be all right. Hallelujah. Isn't she beautiful? Just, just look at her. You want to say anything, baby? You want to say anything? You're not feeling it. Why? Give him praise. She's like some of you. Amen. Come on, Drake. <laughs> I tell you what, give a, I tell you, and I'm so, I'm, they're from, they came in from Washington, D.C. They live in Washington, D.C. Drake works there in Washington and in the political world and uh, doing amazing things. And Jamie was at Fox News in New York City. They met in the White House. Both of them were interning in the White House a few years ago and fell in love. And, uh, and, and we're just so glad. They said, we got to get down to that revival. And uh, let's just see what the Lord's going to do in this place tonight. Isn't that awesome? Chastity online said, I sent my family's picture. Listen to this, Perry. I sent my family's picture during the 21-day fast. My husband, my 21-year-old son. And what, what this about is there are... are uh, hundreds and even thousands if you go to every one of our campuses and add them up there are thousands and thousands of pictures of um, family members and families that are in this grill that you can't see but I can see it while I preach and while they sing every song we during our 21 day fast uh, we decided to cover them with every service and with prayer and put them on the altar so I sent my family's picture during the 21 day fast. My husband, my 21 year old son, my 18 year old daughter gave their lives to the Lord last week during the revival. We have been watching every night and it has really impacted our entire family. Welcome to our online revival, amen. We're so glad you're there. We're so glad you're there. Listen to this one. This is uh, uh, um, Artina online. And she said, on Friday, Perry Stone did an altar call for the Holy Spirit, and I received my prayer language after 33 years. After 33 years. This is um, Tina, Tina online. My youth small group has watched nearly every night of the revival from Covington, Louisiana. We make my living room floor an altar, and we have felt the power of God moving in this place. Here's... Uh, Medina, and she said, I've watched every night of the revival from Australia. I had suddenly, I had suddenly lost my younger brother a few years ago, and a, and a year after that, my other brother also passed away. I have been set free this week. I have surrendered fully to God, and he has healed my heart from grief. He preached on that one night. It was so powerful. And one more. This is Chris online again. Uh, such a powerful revival. I've been watching online and I feel God from my home just as if I was there. Mm, I don't know about that one, but uh, uh, I'm glad you're feeling it, but it, it's something special about being here. And, and let me just say this, if you're new to, to what God is doing, the greatest things seem to happen uh, once we get into the altar services and people just, just let the, the Spirit of God soak them. And I don't know, I don't know, I'm not trying to, I'm just telling you what I've observed. Special moments, moments that mark you, happen. Sometimes when you linger, just, just wait on the Lord. Such a powerful revival. I've been watching online. I feel God from my home just as if I was there. Friday night, God filled me with the Holy Spirit for the first time in my life in my bedroom. Would you welcome Evangelist Perry Stone? We love him very much.
That's amazing. Amazing. To God be the glory. You, you can be seated. You know, Pam received some emails today that were absolutely un incredible. Some people that had been away from church for years. And some of them came to church here and have already got connected with, uh, with groups and things and people. So thank you for that, for that part. But we're happy to be here. Uh, don't you miss tomorrow night's service. It's going to be very special. Uh, Charlie's back because uh, you seem to enjoy the products that we brought. I said, bring some new stuff. So hold it up, Charlie. We have the, oh, if you want to know what's going on in the Middle East, Unleashing the Beast, that's the book to get. Go get it. If you want to understand the Islamic Connection, uh, Iran, that's the book. That was written 20 years ago, and it's got everything happening now. It's, cr it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Okay, next, next, next. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, there you go. The Apocalypse Made Easy. There you go for all you folks that want to understand the book of Revelation. That's a good one. Okay, ne that's a DVD, right? Am I right, DVD? And there's those shawls that y'all keep wanting. I can't figure you ladies out. You think this is Walmart or something. So... <laughs> Just <laughs> something's going to happen in a few minutes at the end of this message, and I don't want anyone, anyone to miss it. And I'm going to do something that's very different. I've never in my entire 46 years of ministry, 47 years of ministry, done what we're about to do tonight, but it's going to fit into this service perfectly. Matthew chapter 12, 43 through 45, and I'm reading from the New King James translation for those that put the scriptures up. And if you heard what I was going to minister, you know, but if you don't, I'm preaching on how Satan selects his victims. And Matthew chapter 12, 43 through 45, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, and that can be a man or woman, by the way, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. Then he says, I will return to my house. And that house there is not your physical home where you live. It's referring to the physical body, which is your physical home, your physical house, the house of the flesh. The New Testament for believers calls it, calls it the temple of the Holy Spirit, your body, the temple. And when he, that spirit, comes back, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits. And I want you, I want you to look at this phrase, more wicked than himself. And they enter in and they dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. So will it be with this wicked generation. This is a literal verse on spiritual warfare that has so many details in it. But we're not going to spend a lot of time trying to break the actual verse down. Other than saying, what's it talking about here? First of all, some scholars suggest that it's talking about how spirits enter people's life. But they have access to come and go. I saw a man one time that was an alcoholic, and he loved Jimmy Swaggered records. This was back when Jimmy was, uh, had the records really going on television. And I went to his house to visit him, and you could tell he was tormented by a spirit. It was terrible. And he put Jimmy on, and he settled down, and he would begin to weep. When the Jimmy Swaggered record ended, he would turn into almost another person. And his wife would say, quick, quick, put another record on to, her, to the son. She said, I have to play these records continually. This is the only thing that brings him comfort. When the music ends, he goes back with this spirit controlling him. Now, that example, if you want to know where that would be in the Bible, is when King David brought a harp into King Saul's palace. And he began to strum the harp. And the Bible says Saul was tortured by an evil spirit. But when David began to play, the scripture says he was refreshed and made well. So spirits can come and go. And this is why a person may not always be angry all the time or violent all the time or going crazy all the time because the spirit backs up from them and hides. And then under certain conditions, under pressure, the tormenting spirit returns. This could be a reference to that in this passage. And then it says he finds seven more spirits more wicked than himself. And let me add there that there are levels of wickedness in spirits just like there are people. Some people have one weakness. Some people have a major sin they battle with. Some people have many sins. And some people are like terrorists. They are reprobate minds and they are pure evil. So those men, I have no doubt, were not just on drugs. Those men that killed those individuals the way they did had to be controlled by devils and evil spirit. You cannot behead a baby's head without being full of the devil. I don't care who you are or what nation you're from. It's just true. So this, the Bible teaches that there are, more, there are some spirits that have more wicked levels than others. And then it says that if the person 
who has been refreshed, maybe in the presence of God or maybe renewed temporarily in their mind, if they open the door again and go back on the Lord, now one of the terms used in scripture would be to slide back or backsliding. What can happen is that spirits that left them can come back, but seven more will come back. And that person is actually in worse condition with the seven than they were with the one. Can I ask you a question? And just as kind of a private question without giving names out, but has anybody ever had anybody in your family that was serving the Lord and they really truly went completely back? And now it seems that they are impossible to deal with. Put your hand up if you know what I'm saying. See, that's what we're talking about here. And this is the warning that Jesus gave. Now, here is a strange enigma, and that's a fancy word for mystery. Here's a strange mystery, and it's a family mystery that I have observed over, you, over the years. There's always been attacks on families. Satan hates the family. He hates the family of God. He hates human families. But there's four levels of attacks that come. Now, I almost wish God has me another direction that I could preach on these four things because they are fascinating. Number one, there are generational cycles. My, I know of people that have had nervous breakdowns hit in their family every 20 years for 100 years. That's a cycle when it has a certain number attached to it, and that number repeats itself in your family. Five years later, 10 years later, that's a cycle. There's generational patterns. Some people learn to do things by what they saw growing up. An abusive grandfather to the grandmother will produce an abusive father to the mother and a son to his wife because they learn to watch by patterns and patterns are repetitive. You can learn things by patterns. There are, I believe, in the lives of some people, generational curses. And I believe when I talk about a curse, the Hebrew word for curse in the Old Testament means to make small, to make little, or to reduce in size. So it doesn't mean they're running around like, oh God, I'm cursed, I'm cursed, I'm cursed, but it means they never succeed, they never make it, they never have peace, they never have joy. It's like they're always in a terrible negative situation, and that could be classified by the Hebrew word curse, a generational curse that seems to be handed down from in families. And the fourth, and this is the one I want to kind of key up on and, and deal with tonight, are generational spirits. A generational spirit would be better termed from the Old Testament, a familiar spirit. Now, what is a familiar spirit? Well, the word familiar reveals what that spirit is because it's a demonic entity or a demonic spirit that is familiar with people, places, and things. For example, if it's a family that has lived maybe in a town, let's just use Gainesville, they've lived here for 100 years, then spirits that attach themselves to Gainesville when Gainesville first became a city can be attached to the people who helped establish it if they were not believers. If they were moonshiners, drug dealers, alcoholics, it can establish a foothold of that particular problem in that particular city. And I'm gonna give you something strange. And I don't like to be you know, controversial with things. I really don't. I like, I like everybody to love me. <laughs> Uh, if you don't, if you don't like me, it's because you don't know me. Because if you knew me, you love me. I tell you, yeah, Perry Stone, you'd like Perry if you knew him. But um, you know, we all know that uh, in the state of California, Pastor has a great church there, and there are great people there. By the way, I want to say in California, wonderful people, many wonderful people. But in San Francisco, most people know that there is a sin problem in San Francisco, and we know what it is. It's the same sex lifestyle. It's been there for, been there for ages. But did you ever notice the steel, the 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 state seal of that area? It is Minerva, who is a female Roman goddess dressed in a man's outfit. So in other words, well, I wish I could preach on that. That's a whole other message. I could go off on that and just tell you all kinds of do, do, do. I mean, it is, it is a strange day today. So do, 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 do. You know, if we get a little weird, you know, we know why we're in a weird day today. All right. But what I'm saying is that ancient spirits established themselves in a territory and one of the other things about the San Francisco area, and I'm not picking on San Francisco, I'm just making a point on generational spirits. So keep in mind the context here. But in, uh, in 1849, gold was found at Sutter's Mill in San Francisco, and that's how the gold rush got the state of California developed. 
I saw this on the History Channel, and I thought, oh, my goodness. Now, that makes sense as to the spirit that could have established itself. The miners that went there did not take a lot of females with them because it was a rough journey. They left the wives back at home. But on the weekends, the men would get drunk, and they actually brought girls' clothes and dressed men up in the girls' clothes, and you know the rest. So when you put those things together, you understand that in the early days, whatever the negative thing was or the sin was in that area establishes the spirit that can control that area. So in the line of familiar spirits, a familiar spirit could be in a family and it could be, let's say they were bootleggers and moonshiners and you watch, there'll be alcoholic problems that'll grow in that family for 50, 60, 70, 80 years. Same thing with drugs. If it was a family of drug dealers, you will find that that spirit, even though there's Christians in the family, there'll be a child that'll come along, it'll struggle because the spirit is familiar. Now, what, let me give you one example and we're gonna, we're, gonna go, we're gonna go to something else. In Mark Mark chapter 5, when the man was delivered from demons, remember the man had 2,000 demons. What did the demons say when Jesus said to the man, what is your name? He's not asking for the man's biological name. He's asking for the name of the spirit that's controlling him, making him break iron chains and break wooden feathers. This guy's like a maniac. He's got everybody scared on the whole area of Gadara in Israel. And this is in the Bible. And they said, what is your name? And the, man, the, demon, the demon said, my name is Legion, for we are many. Where did the name Legion come from? A Roman legion was 5,800 to 6,000 soldiers. And so it had seen legions of soldiers, and there were over 2,000 spirits at least in the man. So it took on the name of something it was familiar with. But watch what the demon said. Please do not send us out of the country. It wanted to stay in the area it was familiar with. And so this is what a familiar spirit is. Now, if that, everybody understands that, put your hands together just to let me know that you got that. I want to make sure you're getting it before we, before we go into the depth of this. So here's this strange enigma. Let's just say, I'm going to use a, a number four because it's an even number. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but if you have four children in the family, three might be dedicated to God, but one will definitely be rebellious. <laughs> if you have four children in the family, three might go to church, but one will always resist going to church. If you have four children in the family, there'll be three of them that seem they can make it in life and whatever they do, but there'll be that one that struggles all the time, calling you for help, needing money, needing the car, needing, needing something consistently. If you have four, there'll be three that can receive an instant deliverance when they get saved, but there'll always be that one that struggles. And that has been a, a, that's been something that's always, I've wondered about in my mind because I have met thousands, hundreds of thousands of people with two children, three children, five children, and there's always one that they love so dearly, but it's that one that seems that the enemy, one that they love so dearly, but it's that one that seems that the enemy has his eye on, that the enemy tries to target for some reason or for some person. Now, I don't have four. I have two, but I can tell you something about two kids. One is compliant and one is defiant. I have a girl and I have a boy, a girl named Amanda and a boy named Jonathan. Let's go back to the earlier years, not now, but to the earlier years. With Amanda... You could say, Amanda, and she'd say, what? <laughs> Little smile on her face. And if you, she did, never wanted to break your heart. She never wanted to make you feel sad. She never wanted you to be disappointed in her. And you, you, all you had to do was say, please do not do that. Yes, dad, okay. And she never gave us a problem. And she's 22 years of age, never gave us any problem whatsoever. Now, my son, on the other hand, <laughs> was named Jonathan. And I said to Pam years ago, I said, you know, I'm worried about Jonathan because he has such a rational intellectual mind at age six, seven, and eight, he could very easily be an atheist. I took him on the road when he was five years of old, with, five years old with Charlie. We were preaching in Marietta, Georgia. And, he, and after the service, he comes into the bed, he said, to the bedroom where we're staying, uh, changing for service that night. He said, Dad, I got to ask you a question. Yep. He said, you said men were made from dust, right? Yes, sir. Adam was made from dust. Yes, sir. That's right, son. That's right. Made from clay, right? Yeah. He said, well, I want to ask you a question. How come when it rains, we don't melt? I said, well, what do you mean? He said, if I play with clay and put water on it, it melts. And we're made of clay. How come we don't melt? I said, who asked you to ask me that question? He said, nobody. I'm asking myself. And then he asked me this one about, okay, let me ask you something. 
If you said Jesus is the only begotten son of God, right? He said, five years old. Yes, sir, I said, that's right, son, I said that. So Jesus is the only begotten son. Then you turn around and told everybody that we're the sons of God. Now, wait a minute. If there's only one begotten son of God, how come there be all these other sons of God? Dad, you gotta get this thing right because you're wrong somewhere. <laughs> he, am I telling the truth? Five years old. And then we'd say this, Jonathan, don't do that. Why? <laughs> Just because mom and dad said, don't, Why? One time, he said, why, 10 times. And if you didn't have an absolute explanation that you can prove to him, we found out later he had a little bit of autism and he, he's a genius, and that was the thing. He absolutely is an intellectual genius. But I'm telling you, here's the deal. If you, <laughs> if you got two kids, I can guarantee you, one of them will help you pray and the other one will keep you praying. I mean, one will say, Daddy, come on, let's, uh, let's join hands and agree. And the other one just said, got to pray again. Come on, honey, we got to pray. Got to get on our knees. I mean, hell's breaking loose. <laughs> it's breaking loose again. Okay, so I've got a question for you. Jonathan was born first. Amanda was born second. And he's the one that I know the enemy tried to attack the most. And drug addiction, alcohol addiction, almost died. I thought we were going to lose him in a hospital one night with, with uh, overdose of drugs and so I wanted to know this, and I want you to follow me very carefully because what I'm about to get into now is the message, and it's very important. Why is it that in every family there is one that no matter what you do, now this is not every case. Some people have all these kids, and they're all saved and doing wonderful, praise God, hallelujah. But it just seems in my travels of 47 years with every Christian family, there will be one that just seems to be under an attack all the time. Now, if you have one that's under an attack throughout life pretty consistently, I want you to raise your hand right now and hold it up real high and let me see. There's one in the family, up in the balcony, raise your hand. Now, wave it, because it's hard for me to see the hand. Okay, that's 40% of the congregation, maybe 50. That's about what I expected. So let me ask you a question. What's the problem and where does it come from? I'm gonna ask you another question. To all of you that said there is that one, how many of you, it's your firstborn that seems to be the one that has the biggest problems in life? Raise your hand up and hold it up real high. Come on, firstborn, 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 firstborn. Okay, now that reduced by a level, but I have been in churches, listen carefully, churches with 40, 400 to 500 people, and I would ask them, is your firstborn the one that struggles the most? And you ready for this? 75% of the congregation raised their hand. So I began to ask myself this question. Why is it that many times, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to back it up by the Bible, that the firstborn child born in a family, especially if it is a boy, tends to be the one that the enemy will try to target the most in its, in its early years, childhood years, teen years, and early married years. Would you like for me to try to answer that right now? Shout yes. It is because that in the law of God and in the law of the word of God, the firstborn son, let me just quote it from the Bible. Exodus 15, 13, 15. Holy is the male child that opens up the womb. Let me quote, let me quote another one. In fact, all through the book of Exodus, holy is the firstborn. Holy is he that opens up the matrix, the matrix, the womb. Holy is the beast of the field, the firstborn of the beast. Everything in scripture the cattle, the sheep, the goat, the animals, all the animals, and in the family. All males that were born force first in the animal kingdom and in the kingdom of, of humans was holy to the Lord. In other words, God separated them in his sight to be holy to him. Now, now, now this is important you hear this. Why? Because in the human family, if you were the firstborn son in the family, you received the blessing from the father and you received the birthright blessing. The birthright blessing meant that when your father died, you get double of everything that was part of your inheritance. If your daddy left you 10 cows, if you're the firstborn son, you got 20. If he left you 10 sheep, you actually get 20. If he left you 50 camels, you're going to get 100 if there's that many in the family. 
And this is why two brothers had a war. They were called Jacob and Esau. And if you'll remember, Esau is coming out first and Jacob's doing what? Grabbing his heel, holding on to the heel of his brother. So Esau was supposed to get what? The blessing and the birthright. And what happened? Esau sold his birthright and traded it out for a bowl of beans. He was hungry, thought he was going to die. He was fainting. And his brother Jacob said, give me your birthright and I'll give you, I'll give you a meal like you've never had. Go ahead. And he signed it over. And once he did it, God said, and watch the power of the mouth. Once he did it with his mouth, he gave him no paper. He signed nothing. I'm going to preach this in a minute because we're going to do something in the altar service. Hey, hey, hey. When it came out of his mouth, God honored it. And he could not go back and take it back. And then you know the story of how he tricked his dad and covered his arm. This is, this is Jacob acting like he was Esau to get his blessing. Now listen. Oh my Lord, I feel the anointing. I know where we're going with this. Once the father... Once Esau released the birthright, because he spoke it, God honors vows. God honors covenants. God honors promises. We don't sometimes, but he always does. God had to, he could not get it. He couldn't reverse what, he couldn't reverse it. When the father put the blessing on Jacob, Esau comes in and says, what are you doing? You got my birthright now. You want my blessing? The father could not undo. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost because I know where we're headed. You don't. The father could not reverse that once he spoke that over. Moses blesses the tribes of Israel. Jacob blesses his 12 sons with the prophetic word leaning on the top of the staff. And can I tell you, every blessing Moses spoke He died. When those tribes went to the promised land, those blessings were fulfilled. Everything that Jacob said to those 12 sons when he spoke it just with his mouth, he said it with his mouth, was fulfilled down the road. I'm just going to let you know in advance what we're about to do. We're about to break the curse over your kids and grandchildren, and the fathers tonight are going to speak a blessing that God is going to honor to release your family from those generational things. Hallelujah! that the enemy has tried to bring in your life. Give God a shout while you're praising them. And I'm, and I'm setting the foundation from the word of God for that. Now, let me show you the firstborn battles. So holy, if you have a firstborn son, he is separated in the eyes of God to be a special son. Most preachers, firstborn sons become the preacher. I'm the, firstborn, I'm the firstborn son of my daddy. I became the preacher. Most firstborn sons become the preacher. If they don't, now watch me, they are the ones that come under the attack of the enemy. Mm, Drake, I see your daddy looking at you. Look at him. <laughs> you, you might be a preaching president one day. We had a preaching president one time. He was a preacher, but he became president. Who knows? Okay, I'm not, I'm not, that was not a prophecy from God, by the way. Just want you to know. I just, Bring peace to your mind. All right. Here we go. Abraham's first biological son was Ishmael. Not Isaac, but he had Ishmael through Hagar. That was his first biological son. His first covenant son was Isaac through Sarah. There's where the covenant was. But guess what happens with Ishmael? He gets kicked out of the house, and God says, Ishmael shall be a wild man, and his hand shall be against every man. So the firstborn, Ishmael, ended up being a wild man. And I'm going to tell you what it says in Hebrew. He'll be a wild ass. And that meant a wild donkey. It got awful quiet in this sanctified Pentecostal church when I just said wild ass from the pulpit. King, look, for you King James lovers, all, all of us conservative Bible people, we love the King James. It says that. I'll get off that subject. I can tell you we're going to mess it up if I stay on that. 
Isaac's firstborn was Esau. Esau became angry and hated his brother for 20 years and wanted him dead till they got restoration. Jacob's first son was Reuben. Guess what Reuben did? He lost his inheritance because he defiled his father's bed with his concubine. That's his firstborn. Look at all his firstborn son problems. David's firstborn son was Amnon. Amnon ended up raping his half-sister and ended up being killed by his own half bro his, own, his own brother. Solomon's firstborn son was Rehoboam. Guess Guess what he did? He became the king and ended up splitting the kingdom of Israel and dividing Israel's right straight down the middle. And I can't even tell you, I'd have a list this long if I took all the Old Testament kings that their firstborn sons became kings and they did evil in the sight of God. It is amazing how it'll say that the father did that which was right, but here comes the firstborn son and he did evil which was in the sight of the Lord and went into Moloch worship and Ashtaroth worship and idolatry because the enemy was trying to defile the power and the blessing that is in the family through the power of the firstborn. Why does the enemy attack firstborn sons? Are you ready? Because they carry on the family name. Your daughters don't carry on your family name. My daughter is Amanda Stone. I've told her to marry a stone. So that all the baby's last name will be Stone. That's probably not going to happen. But I have a Jonathan Stone who just had a baby named Andy Stone, the happiest baby I've ever met, a little boy. So now I was so proud because you know what that makes a dad proud, a grandfather proud? Now somebody will carry on the name Stone because, and listen, that's the reason why throughout the Bible that Satan always tried to kill the male child. Because only the male child could carry on the seed. As a matter of fact, ooh, we're going to get really wiggy here in a minute. Ooh, Jesus. <laughs> but as a matter of fact, there's some really strange verses in the Old Testament. Now, just by the way, everybody say this with me. Thank God, Thank God. we don't do this today. In the Old Testament, I have a brother named Philip, okay? But in the Old Testament, if I were to die without having children, my wife would have to marry my brother in order to carry on my name. And she'd rather shoot herself. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> if my brother's probably watching, Philip, that was not an insult to you. I'm just trying to be funny. I'm just, your brother's just trying to be funny. You know me, okay? Don't take offense, please. Don't text me after church. <laughs> but now, <laughs> <laughs> Please pardon my humor. It just comes out in me. I was going to be a comedian before I got called to preach, by the way. So I figured. But I mean, can you imagine what that would be like? I mean, I mean, we're, now we're not living that. Now, everybody say, thank God. Some of you, some of you m women ought to really say, thank God, because you know what your brother-in-law is like. I mean, could you imagine how awful that would be? I'm going to get off of that because that's, that's just bad. That's bad imagery for the church in, tonight in the house of God. But my point is that I want you to understand why it was important to carry on the family name. God was so concerned about a man's name being erased from the earth that he established laws to ensure that his name would never be erased from the house of Israel. So no wonder that in the Bible, the, the power of the enemy is set to attack the firstborn in the family or the firstborn son. Now let's go to this. So how do spirits select their victims? And I could really build this up for, you know, five minutes and get into it, but let's get right to the fact. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 21, there was a boy that had seizures, and he was a young child. The Bible said he was a child, which is under the age of 12 normally in Judaism, under the age of 12, probably somewhere around 7, 8, 9, 10 years of age. In Matthew 15 and 22, there's, the scripture says there was a woman whose daughter was grievously vexed by a demon. We do not know her name, but she was living at home with her mother, so we can assume she was not married. We can also assume she was probably not in her late teens because they married very early back then. She was a, a, a young person. So please listen to what I'm about to say. I, mean, I, I feel your anointing, Lord. Thank you. The demonic spirits select their victims when they're children. But how do they select them? Do they just randomly say, let's see, let's pick that one. No, it's not a random selection. 
because I'm going to explain to you why, first of all, the enemy selects them as children because he tries to destroy them in their youth to impact them later in their life so that their descendants will not be serving God. If he can get you as a child with wrong thinking, you're a girl to believe you're a man. You go into same-sex relations, which can't even produce children. What happens is then he begins to impact not just your life and your emotions and confuses your emotions and it gets your emotions all stirred up. But here's what it does. It then affects any children that you would have in the future. Any children that would be coming to you in the future, it is going to impact them in a negative way. And here's what it puts on them. Ready? Everybody ready? It puts on them a spirit of confusion. And there has never been a generation that I can remember. My generation didn't have this issue. But they are literally confused about their identity. They're confused about their sex. They're confused about who they are. They're confused about what they are. They're confused. If you were to sum up this generation, you would sum it up by being manipulated and tormented by an absolute crazy spirit of confusion. Come on, if you, if you understand that, let the Lord know. I agree, because it's just true, all right? Even in the time of Pharaoh, they wanted, Pharaoh wanted the male children destroyed that were born into the Hebrew households. I believe he was doing it because there was a prophecy. He didn't know it, but there was a prophecy that said very clearly that God was going to visit the Hebrew people one day. And then if you'll discover what Josephus said, Josephus said that two Egyptian magicians named Janez and Jambres, that they had a dream that, there was, that Egypt was in one scale and a lamb was in another scale. This is crazy. And the lamb outweighed Egypt. And they predicted to him, there's a lamb coming. There's somebody coming in the Hebrews and there's a lamb coming that's going to defeat Egypt. Well, you know, that happened many years later when the blood of a lamb was placed on the doorpost of the Egyptian's house, right? And the death angel passed by. Now that's in the writings of Josephus. You can look that up at some point. So in the time of Jesus, Herod had all of the males the under two years of age, in fact, all the children, but especially the males because it was he, a king of the Jews was to be born. And that day it would have been a man. All of them would be killed in Rama or Ramo, which was a 10 mile radius. Now I saw something one time, give me just a second. I got, and I'm going to tell you one of the weirdest stories that ever happened to my family. But um, we were in the church of the nativity in Bethlehem years ago, and we gave that church a really good donation to build a youth center for the, for the Christian Arab kids behind the church. And the, the, the priest came and he said, Reverend Stone, because you've done this, I want to take you to a place that nobody sees. I thought, okay, that's going to be cool. He takes me into the lower basement of this church. And he said, I want you to look into what, and behind these bars were bones and piles and piles of infant bones. I'm talking so dried that if you were to touch them, they would, uh, they would completely go away. And he said, these are the remains of the infants of Bethlehem. Now, I didn't ask him to prove that to me. I didn't ask him a lot of questions. I just started weeping. I mean, they're, they're about that deep. And they're, remember that, Charlie? We, I, we probably have this on video, don't we, at some point? And so the, why would the enemy attack the children? To prevent them from being leaders and deliverers. Moses was a deliverer. Jesus was a savior. Can I tell you that when your kids are coming under attack, it's not about where they are now. It's about where they're going to go down the road. So come on. Some of you young people need to understand that is to prevent you from being what you need to be. Now I'm going to tell you the, one of the weirdest stories that ever happened to Pam and I. When my son Jonathan was born, he was born in December, two days before Christmas. What year was it, honey? Do you remember exactly? No. 89. Y'all tease me because I, every, all these baby questions I got to ask mama over here. All right, now 10 months later, let's see, that would be about 10 months later, it was October. Let me tell you when it was. We were living in an old house. When I say old, not old in age, it was the old, old house where we used to live after we were married. And it was Halloween night. Now that's significant. It was Halloween night. And he had been sleeping rough. Remember, he'd wake up crying at midnight for weeks. And so I said, put him in the bed with us. So, you know, he's in the middle of the bed. He's about that big. He's tiny. Pam's here. I'm there. 
lights out, and all of a sudden, I am awakened by like something like that, and I flip on the light, and he's vomiting. He's choking in his own vomit. Now, you babies can die that way, and I turned him over, and this orange substance started pouring out of him, and I said, Pam, quick, something's happening with Jonathan. It was Jonathan, my son. Now, here's the part that freaked me out of my mind. And, and you'll verify this. Pam was, is not in her head. There was blood where a thumb had taken blood and put it on his side of his temple here and on the side of his temple there. It was not his blood and it was not a scratch because we searched his body for scratches. There were no scratches. He had not scratched himself. It was a fingerprint and nobody had been in that house but me and Pam. I said, Pam, a spirit has got in our house. This is an occult night. It's targeted our baby. Do you understand? And I got up and I started, Charlie remembers this. I started praying. And guess what we find out like the next day in the paper? Guess who had been in our area saying that there were vibes coming from the Tennessee, Cleveland, Chattanooga area that he did not like. And he paid a visit and had an occult meeting in a seance. His name was Anton LaVey, the head of the church of Satan, Chattanooga, Cleveland, Tennessee. And I am absolutely convinced to this day that there was a spirit. And I don't know who put it there or how they did it, but they marked my boy. And I'm telling you, my son, when he got to be 11 years of age to 14 years of age, the enemy attacked him. And I almost lost him through death at least once and maybe twice with drug overdoses. And I remember how we'd have to pray. And I remember we'd have to. And he got up one night, he got up one night and I don't even know what happened. He never would talk about it. He saw something in the house and he got up one night and he came to the bed. He said, dad, 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 please get up, get up. And I jumped up. Of course, when I jumped up, Pam jumped up and Amanda had a little bed beside us over there and she jumped up. My little daughter, how old was Amanda then? About five, maybe something. And he said, up in my room, I've let a demon in the house. He saw it. And he went upstairs, and, and I'm telling you, he, we went upstairs with him, and he started clearing out stuff out of an attic and a closet, three garbage bags full of alcohol, drugs, and everything imaginable. And he started clearing it out because whatever he saw scared him because he thought it was coming to kill him. Let me tell you what mama did. Mm -hmm. My wife is very quiet. She's very quiet. She's not an emotional person. She never screams and hollers at anybody, but she can get stirred. They call her the lioness in the ministry at OCI in Cleveland, Tennessee, the lioness. And I watched her. Now, she's going to say, well, I didn't quite do it like that. Yes, she did. <laughs> I heard her go up the steps to that room. Boom, 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 boom. And I heard her say, devil, I want to tell you something. I'm the mama of this house, and I gave birth to that boy. And I want you to know right now, I am not going to let you torment my boy. And I'm not going to let you kill him with this stuff. And I'm not going to let you take him to hell. So if you're in my house, you get out of my house right now in the name of Jesus. And I just folded my hand. I said, go get him, girl. <laughs> go get him, girl. But I just want to give you a report that the devil didn't kill him. The devil didn't take him out. He's working tonight in a ministry, doing the internet in the back, running sound and lights, working for God, gave me three grandbabies, lives beside me. And I want to say on Halloween night, the devil is a liar. Be Because whatever blood that was, if it was chicken blood or cow's blood, I don't know what it was. It didn't work because there's only one blood that'll do. This blood's for you. I said this blood is for you. And that blood will wash you and cleanse you and deliver you from the power of hell. Oh, God Almighty. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You can sit it for just a moment and listen. So how, so how does the enemy select the, the child as it's growing up? And here's the answer. There are things that happen to a child in their emotions that puts holes in their soul. 
wounds in their spirit. I've researched this and I have asked Christian psychiatrists, is this true? And they, I said, give me some statistics. Every girl that has ever entered into prostitution that ever came to know the Lord that was ever interviewed was molested as a child. The whole came through being molested into the soul. The enemy took advantage of the opening. Pornographic addiction. Many times those who are addicted in their late teens or 20s, 30s, and 40s saw pornography when they were very, very young for the first time. And as a matter of fact, one thing, I'll tell you my personal story. I was 11 years old, and uh, we lived in Arlington, Virginia, near D.C., and we were just running across the road. Me and a bunch of guys were running across the road, kids from the neighborhood about my age, and there was a garbage bag. And I said, what's in that garbage bag in, in all those trees? And it was pornographic pictures, magazines. And I started looking through them, and I can tell you this. I cannot tell you anything I saw. There were 50. There were Playboy magazines. There were stuff I didn't even know existed, but Playboy and all kinds of stuff. And we, took, we actually took them and hid them in the woods and would go and look at them. And I can tell you that to this day, I cannot tell you anything I saw. Watch this, except the first picture. The first picture is still imprinted in my mind, and I am 64 years of age, and that was when I was 11 years old. And I want to say to God be the glory, I never got addicted because I got filled with the Holy Ghost the same year. Oh, you at a youth camp. And because I was filled with the Spirit as a young age, I honestly believe God protected me and preserved me. Stealing begins in youth. And many times, especially in our large cities, it carries over when young men are in their 20s and 30s because it opens up something in them that allows these particular spirits to come. I ask a pastor named Pastor Franklin from North Carolina, who's a counselor, who has counseled hundreds and hundreds of men and women that are in the same sex lifestyle, or we would say the gay lifestyle. And I said, how much of this is a spirit versus how much of it is just what we would call an affection where a female is attracted to a female or a male to a male? He began to explain this to me, but he said, I want to tell you something that you can't preach as a counselor because they would cut you down. The, the, the world of psychology and all the degrees would cut you down. But he said, I've actually had people come into my offices who, who said to me, I am controlled by a spirit. I'm in this lifestyle, but there's something controlling me. And he said, I would say to them, now I'm going to pray for you and believe that Jesus Christ will deliver you from the spirit. And he said, every time, now listen to this, every time, 100%, if it is a man, the spirit that speaks through them sounds like a woman. If it is a girl, the spirit that speaks to them sounds like a male voice. I said every time. He said every single time. I want you to understand, and this is, not a, this is not an attack on anyone or anyone's problem because we want people to be healed. But what happens to people and what happens to children is they see things growing up. They get connected with things growing up. They get wounded. They get molested. They are molested by the same sex. They are molested by the opposite sex. They are molested by a member in the family. They see pornography. They are raped. Something happens to them in their childhood that if the wound is not healed, if somehow it's not healed and somehow it's not covered, then the power of the enemy can come in. Now, to help your child or to help you and you may be an older person now, and you're saying, you're going back in your memory thinking, wow, yeah, I can see that. I got into that, and I know that was my root. I know I kept a door open. I was wounded, and I was hurt when I went through this, and the enemy will take advantage of your emotional hurts. And, and sometimes he'll bring an offense out through your emotional hurts. In the New Testament, and I've got to tell you this, and got one more story left, but I've got to tell you this. In the New Testament, there's a word called redeem or redemption. To redeem something or to be under redemption. We use words today in the church like born again, salvation, a covenant with the Lord, repentance of sin. All of that is connected to a word redemption or redeem in the New Testament the translation of our English Bible. But I want to tell you the Greek words. I want to take this slow <laughs> They told me today at the table, they said, you just preach so fast. You just, just preach so fast. No, it was night, no, the night. You just preach so fast, we just can't hardly keep up with you sometimes because you preach. I could have been an auctioneer. 
If this, somebody said, if this preaching thing fails, come work for me, Perry, at the auction house. You know, all you got to do is go 15, 20, 30. You know, they think you're a professional when you do that. The word redeem or redemption. First word, ex agorazo. Here's what it means in the Bible. Galatians 3.13 is an example of it. To purchase a slave's freedom to buy them out of slavery. In Jesus' day, they sold people publicly as slaves to wealthier people. So a person could come and say, I want to ex agorazo agreement with you. I am going to take them and buy them, but not as a slave. I want to purchase their freedom. And folks, Christ has redeemed us. <laughs> That's the word. So what he did, we were under the bondage before we were converted to Jesus. All of us were. So he purchased us not to be a, a, a slave to things, but he purchased us to say, now I'm getting you out of Satan's slave market. You know, like sex trafficking. It would be like delivering someone who has been bound by a sex trafficker and freeing that girl or that young man from that. He delivered us. And here's the second Greek word, Luke 24, 21. It's lutro, which means to release the slave after providing the ransom. Ex agorazo is purchasing them. Then lutro means to loose them or to let them go from Satan's hand. Satan's power, Satan's bondage. Number three is the Greek word lutrosis, which is the finished work of Jesus. Found, it's, it's a word found in Hebrews chapter 9 and 12. So it means that redemption is complete. When Jesus said it is finished, what he was saying was, what I have done for mankind is now totally complete. There's nothing else that needs to be done except my crucifixion. And you apply that to your life for your salvation. And the final word is apolutrosis, which means delivering the saints at Christ's return. And that is found in Luke 21 and verse 28. So Christ wants to deliver you out of the slave. First of all, he wants to purchase you. He's already paid for you, but some of you haven't accepted the payment yet. He's, he has already purchased your redemption, but some of you haven't, haven't totally accepted it yet. That's why you're here tonight. You need to. And then he's going to, pay, he's going to get you out of it, pay the price for you. And after paying the price for you, he's going to set you free from everything that Satan tried to put you in from the time you were young. From the time you were young. Isn't that amazing? And I'll tell you how it's done in just a moment. One more story. I told you a moment ago about my daughter. And uh, years ago, several years back, she's now 22 years of age. She would have been about 16 years of age. We had a warrior fest. Now, what a warrior fest is, it's just a youth meeting with, it's nothing but young people. And so Pam said, Perry, come here. Said uh, she was on a, a dance team that we had, a worship team, choreography with the gospel music, Christian music, you know. And uh, she said, uh, Amanda wants me to tell you something. Well, what? I'm, I'm going to preach that night. She's getting ready to get up and say something that you don't know about her. Now, I had no idea. I said, do you know what she's going to say? And I think Pam said, no. I mean, she just said she doesn't want to hurt you or me hurt when she says what she's going to say. Well, man, pastor, I don't know how you would feel with that being your, your daughter, but it's like, good Lord, what's she going to say? I mean... What would hurt us? So my little 16-year-old daughter who can preach the house down when she wants to grabs a microphone. And she says, hello, I'm Amanda Stone. I'm 16 years of age. And everybody there basically knew she was Perry Stone's daughter. And she says, I was raised in a Christian home. And she started talking about that she went to church, but she went to church to see friends. She didn't go to church to have a relationship with the Lord. Then this came out of her mouth. Man, I'm her dad, and she lives in my house, and I didn't even know this. At, LA, at age 11, I saw pornography for the first time. And I became addicted to pornography for four years. And I'm sitting over here, and I'm not angry. I'm crying like a baby saying, hey, God, how come I didn't know this? I mean, how come I, it wasn't revealed? You could have given me a dream. And then I'm thinking, how in the world could my baby who lives in the, in a, in a, in the bedroom right down the hall 
And she, you know, she got a little, a little computer. What do you call it? An iPad? So iPod, iPad, whatever, you know, one of those. And she went to a channel for kids and they, they, they target kids pornography by go, kids going to cartoons and stuff. And there it was full blown. And she became addicted to it. Then I heard her say this, and this is for you. It's for some of you young people. She said, I would come to church and never wanted anybody to know what was wrong with me because I was afraid they would look down on me. They would say, you're a pastor's daughter. How could you do that? You should be the example. I'm going to tell you something. Church people can be cruel to preacher's kids. You know, they want them to lift some standard, but you're, you know, your kids are here, but you want the preacher's kids to be up here. Come on, their kids like your kids. Okay, I am one. I'm a PK. So she said that one night after a big service that she went to her bedroom and she got down and she, with her Bible and she said, Lord, I do not want this in my life anymore. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of just the cycle. And she said when she really made up her mind that she was just so sick and tired that God came in the room and touched her. And literally at that moment, it happened that quick, took all that feeling and pressure completely out of her. Now, of course, she changed, you know, she made sure she didn't see stuff. She puts blocks up. You got to do that. And today she is one of the most, she teaches art at the ramp in Hamilton for Karen Wheaton's ministry. But she is one of the most word-centered girls you will meet in your life. I could give her the mic and she could get up here and testify and start preaching. She has all kinds of gifts and she's helped a lot of young people with just a simple testimony that if you don't want it, then you don't have to have it. And sometimes the reason, some of you young people, sometimes the reason you struggle is because you want to keep holding on to whatever that might be. And only if you want real, if you want real freedom, the only way to get it is to just say, I don't want to be this way anymore. And it, it, that's, you know, can I tell you, can I tell you the word repent not, does not always mean I'm sorry. The Greek word means to change your mind and do a complete 180. It's in the head and the heart right here. Pastor, uh, you, didn't, you didn't know I was going to do this. You're, you're a spiritual father. I'm a spiritual father. Pastor, I know you're a spiritual son to the spiritual father, but you're a pastor, okay? Joe, you're an evangelist, and you have kids, so you're at the level of, of, a, of a father to the, a generation. I need you four men to come to the platform with me in a moment, because we're going to do a declaration of prayer in just a minute. So if all three of you, Pastor Franklin and Brother Mark and you, would you all come up here with me and join me here? Because when the crowd comes, it's going to be harder for you to get up here. So come on up here and just stand on the platform. Now, I'm going to tell you what we're about to do. How many of you have your child with you. Now, when I say child, look, if you're 14, 15, and mom and daddy calls you child, don't get mad because when you're 50, everything under 50 is a child. <laughs> so don't get mad. Hey, don't call me. I'm not a child. How many of you have your kid with you tonight? Raise your hand. You have a, you have, ra raise it up, raise it up, raise it up. All right. Now, how many young people are here? Raise your hand. All of you youth. I love y'all sitting in that section. One of these night, one of these days, like tomorrow night, just shout me down preaching. Just shout me down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just shout me down preaching. I love. It. Let me tell you what we're going to do, and I'm going to go back to what I said. This is very serious. It's very important because what we're about to do is going to work. It's going to happen. It's going to work. The Lord began to show me, and I preached a little bit of it to you that when Esau just simply said it, God marked it with His words, and when 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 Isaac said to to Jacob, here's your blessing. He thought it was Esau, but the blessing still came. He didn't reverse the blessing. He could not reverse it once it came out of his mouth. When a spiritual father, like Moses was a father to Israel, Isaac was a father. When a spiritual father, and these are all spiritual fathers, I, I believe I'm a spiritual father to a generation. When they begin to speak over your life, listen to me, you don't need your natural daddy to do it. 
You need a spiritual father. So you say, well, I don't even have a dad. Don't worry about it. My wife's dad lived eight miles from the church and didn't even show up to give her away at the wedding when she married me. Never gave none of the girls away. But you know what? I know, I know she thinks about that sometimes. She told me one day, she said, you've been more than a father and a husband to me. I don't need him in my life because of what you've been to me. So if you don't have a physical father, don't get all depressed about that because these are spiritual fathers that speak into your life. We speak life over you, not death. We speak beauty over you. We speak the love of God over you. We speak peace over you. And when we say it, as we say it as spiritual leaders, when we speak it, guess who honors it? Okay, God, Abba in heaven. There's your real daddy right there, your heavenly father. Now, everybody that's got a child with you, or you, not, not, I, I shouldn't even say child, but your young person's with you, stand, bring them to the front and stand behind them right now. Would you do that? Bring them up to the front. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, my. Okay. Come, come all the way up to as close to the altar as you can. And if the parent will get directly behind the children and mom and dad both can do this. And I know we're going to have the only thing, Jensen, we didn't build the altars big enough, did you, son? Didn't know there was going to be that many altar calls. All the young people come to the platform. All the young people come to the platform. We're going to make room for you up here. Hallelujah. 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 This is very special. We're not doing this just to do it. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit has told us to do this tonight, and it's, it's from the Lord. Uh, those of you on the internet, that, that house of young girls that was there in Louisiana, if you're watching, those of you that are watching with children in your house, get them where you're at right now, around the TV. Keep coming. We're not going to rush this because this is a very, very important thing we're about to do. Amen, 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 amen. All the elders, if you want to get, get oil, and we're just going to start walking. And Now, I realize that there's a lot of people in the aisles, but what I want you to do is get your hands on the shoulder of your, the one that you love, those kids. It matters not if you're adopted. We were adopted into God's family, all of us. So adoption in God's sight makes you a son and daughter. If you were adopted, if you feel like you're a stepchild, that does not matter. It's about what we're about to do. And I want you to get the revelation. I want you to get the revelation that when we start praying over you, that God will hear this. And here's what I'm gonna pray. Pastor, do you have a certain prayer that you're feeling right now? Because I want God to break generational junk off of them. Whether it's three generations, two generations ago, I want God to just break that off of them so they will not be tempted to go the way that those in the past ancestors erred, erred from the Lord. So I'm going to pray that. Then, Pastor, I'm going to give it to you. Now, all you young people, I know you don't have anyone here to lay hands on you, and we'd be here till morning, I think, if we did that. But that's not necessary. It's the power of the Word. And I want you to put your hand over your heart. And I want you to keep your hand there while we're praying. Everybody getting with your children right now. Put your hand on them right now. Mom or dad, I want you to put your hand right on their head, on their shoulder. And I'm going to pray. And I need everybody that's seated to just honor the Lord. In fact, if you'd like to stand, would you do that? And I want you to put your hands, divide up. And some of you point that way, some that way, some that way, some that way, and some up here. And when I'm praying, and as long as Pat, anybody up here is praying, you agree with this. Everybody ready? Father in heaven, I come to you in the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world. 
And I have ministered the word of the Lord the way that you put it in my spirit to share. And I thank you for that. But now, Lord, I want them to have the revelation. I want these young people and I want these parents and grandparents to have the revelation that when we speak at this moment, that this is sealed in the books of heaven before the almighty God and before the holy angels around the throne. That this is not just a regular church service. That this is a service of blessing. And just like the patriarch Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and David, and the patriarchs of old would lay their hands upon their bloodline, this is our spiritual bloodline. These are spiritual sons. These are spiritual daughters. These are family of God. This is the family of God. I ask you, God, in the name of the Son of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Son of God, to whom all power is given in heaven and earth, break generational junk. What has been on them from their past, well, if it's pornography, if it's drugs, if it's alcohol, if it's the spirit of anger, if it's the spirit of abuse, if it's the spirit of confusion, if it's a spirit of homosexuality, God, whatever was generational in their past that might even be an inch in their DNA, let the blood of Jesus be applied to their actual DNA today in the name of Jesus. Woo! I'm asking you, God, to remove everything I speak blessing over them. I rebuke that God that has tried to hold on to them. I rebuke the stronghold in the name of Jesus that has tried to hold on to them for all of this time. Now loose them in the name of the Lord. Let the blessing of God come in the name of Jesus. Let it begin to manifest and let your power and your name be upon them. We put the name Yahweh upon them. We put the name Jehovah God upon them, that they will be separated under the Lord for the work of the kingdom. Parents, start praying for them right now. Pastor's coming. Praise the Lord. Come on. Come on, young people, pray. Everybody, everybody pray right now. Pray, 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 pray. Just pray a moment. Just seek the Lord. Just seek Him. Just, just close your eyes and lift your hands and say, Lord, I, I just seek right now your peace and your power and your presence. Just worship Him. Open your mouth. Forget about people around you and just begin to worship the Lord. Just begin to exalt Him. Just begin to speak the name of Jesus. Speak that name. Begin to say it, Jesus. Remember what He said. A blessing comes through words. A curse comes through words. So speak the name of Jesus. It breaks the curse. It breaks the power of Satan. Begin to praise the name of Jesus. Begin to praise Him verbally, out loud, with your mouth. He works with words. Speak it. Speak it. Lord, we receive tonight the power of the blood of Jesus. Right here, right now, we just plead the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that the power of the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus is active this very moment, cleansing and breaking every stronghold, every power of Satan, every stronghold of Satan is breaking in the name of Jesus. We speak it over the young people. We speak it over moms and dads. We speak it over grandparents. We speak it over families. We speak it over marriages. We speak and bind and destroy the spirit of divorce. We come against it in the name of Jesus. We come against the bitterness. We come against the offense. We come against that hurt that lingers for generations. We bind it and we cast it out in the name of Jesus Christ. We plead the blood of the Lamb over every door posts, over every home, over every family, over every grandchild, 
over every child. We plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Now do it, parents. Do it, grandparents. Take authority. Take authority right here, right now. Hey, young people, take authority if mom is bound. Take authority if you know your dad is lost. Take authority if you've got a brother or a sister that is messed up right now and the enemy has them. You are here by divine appointment on Halloween night to take authority over Satan in your home. Everybody on Halloween night, throw up your hands and plead the blood of Jesus Christ. You are not defenseless against these attacks. You have power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the blood of Jesus. Speak it in the name of Jesus. We are not defeated. We are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. If you've got a son right now, turn me up in this monitor, turn me up. If you've got a son right now, begin to plead the blood of Jesus over that son that comes to your mind. If the enemy says, I've got him and you won't get him back. If you've got a daughter and the enemy's whisper to you, I've got him and you won't get him back. Right where you're standing this night on Halloween night, it's the blood of Jesus. Jesus night. We plead the blood of Jesus over our children. Now pray church. Pray right now. You have that authority dad. You have that authority mom. You have that authority grandma. You have that authority grandpa. Pray in the name of Jesus. I want them I want them to put this Bible verse up from the book of Galatians because he preached it masterfully tonight. And this is what it says. You preached about the word redeemed, but what did he redeem us from? From the curse, the curse of divorce, the curse of addiction the curse of depression, the curse of mental illness, the curse of suicide, the curse of gender confusion, the curse of being a slave to sexual sin, the curse of alcoholism, the curse of alcoholism, the curse of alcoholism. We break it in the name of Jesus. Now throw up a praise. Oh, put it back up, put it back up. How, how was the curse broken, Pastor? Christ has redeemed us from the curse because he became a curse for us. It is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. On Calvary, Jesus took every generational curse off of your family. Your generational tree can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ right here, not in the future, not one day, hope so magically, right here in the name of Jesus by faith. So raise your hands. And, and you, gotta, you gotta believe this. You gotta say it with faith in the power of the cross. Say this over your family. See, I believe even these children have power that is released when they speak the Word of God in faith. And you may not feel like you're real spiritual, but when God called that man, I, I've known him for 40 years plus, he was about your age, your age, your age. I was about your age in services like this. When God began to show me who I was, God began to show me that he had a plan beyond Eastern North, and I love my roots, and where, but beyond a cornfield in Eastern North Carolina.
God can break every chain. I want you to get that song ready, break every chain. God can break every chain of limitation off of you. And when we, when we confess this verse, and Perry, jump in anytime. Jump in anytime. But when we speak this, I want parents to take authority over curses that have tried to encroach upon your seed and your family. You have authority to say it stops tonight. All right? You're overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. What does that mean? Derek Prince, who has died and gone on to be with the Lord, but he taught both of us a lot, said that verse in Revelation says, you're overcomers by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. He said his translation of that is we overcome when we make what the Word says the Bible does, our testimony. When we make what the Word, put that verse back up. When we make, no, I want you to go back to the one we just had. Go back to the one we just had. When we make this verse our testimony because of what the blood did on the tree, Christ is going to redeem our families from every curse. Are you ready? Open your mouth, raise your hands, speak it over your marriage, speak it over your family. If it feels like you just can't get free and you, you do better and it just keeps going back, there is power in the blood of Jesus on that tree to redeem your family. Say these words, everybody, read them out loud. Say, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And Jesus died for me and my family, and I plead the blood of Jesus. Now begin to praise him like you really believe it. Sing. Let's worship him now. Let's worship him. Young people, worship him. The Holy Spirit will touch you. He'll touch you right where you are. To break every chain, to break every chain, to break every
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just worship the Lord just a moment. The blood that Jesus shed for me. times I was so afraid comes all my fear and that same blood it will dry all all of your tears oh it's the blood when you feel weak it'll come and give you strength Sing it, reaches. Oh, it's still 
got a feeling everything's gonna be all right I've got a feeling I don't care what circumstances have told you everything's gonna be all right oh I just got a feeling on oh, Halloween night Everything's gonna be all right Hold on I've never been in a, a Holy Ghost service my whole ministry on Halloween night If I ever believe God for miracles and victory over the devil I'm gonna believe for it right here, right now I believe something's about to break Why don't we trust God again? Why don't we believe God again? Why don't we drive a stake in the ground and say it is so in Jesus' name? It'll be all right. It'll be all right. Turn to somebody and say, it's going to be all right. Look somebody in the eyes and say, I've got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Oh, I've got a feeling everything, everything, everything. Some things you can't even put in words. They're so complicated. But everything is going to be all right. Oh, I just got a Holy Ghost feeling. Everything's going to be all right. It'll be all right. Y'all ready? Be all right. I got a feeling everything's gonna be all right. Be alright. Be alright. Come on, 
to dance on the devil's head. So we're going to crank it up one more time. And I want you to dance your dance. I want you to dance like you used to dance for the devil. I want you to dance like you're not ashamed to praise him in the dance. Ready? Come on, follow me. I've got to be everything's gonna be all right is this is the generations getting set free and they don't care what people think they don't care why are you in church on this night you must not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ what's wrong with that this is called revival and in the last days saith God don't you put your little religious box on it. But in the last days, saith God, I'll pour out my spirit on your sons and your daughters. And they'll prophesy, which means to speak.
I want you to, I want you to get one more song. Just because I want to kick the devil in his fangs. Dry bones. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Hey, where's, where's, uh, y'all come on, hold it, hold it, hold it. Y'all come out here. I can't see you. Y'all don't go nowhere. Y'all back up just a little bit if you can. Come on, singers, hurry. Did anybody, did anybody come to give God glory and praise tonight? Let's go. This is the praise that the dead men walk again. I'm playing the game, I'm going to die. I'm going to live, going to live again. This is the sound of the dry bones rattling. Today, this is the sound. This is the sound of the dry bones rattling. 
one more song, he said, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings. He has ordained praise. That's a prophecy and you're seeing it. What y'all want to sing? Get up, get up, get up. Hallelujah. Isn't the Lord good? My goodness. One more. One more. One more. Everybody hold up one more to the one. What do you want to say?
I'm gonna ask you a question. I'm gonna say, here comes freedom. And you have the opportunity to show us what it looks like because we are now all walking in freedom in the name of Jesus. So here we go, here we go. We put those hands together like this, say, here comes freedom. You say, here comes freedom. Yeah. Here comes freedom. Here comes freedom. Yeah. Here comes freedom. Here comes freedom. Here it comes. Here comes freedom. Here it comes, here it comes. Let's go, here it comes. Here comes freedom. 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 Here we go, here we go. Here we go. I'm actually trying to say this is what it looks like. the Lord is doing they will never forget this night of freedom in church under the blood and the name of Jesus turn to somebody and say you're a history maker I want you to raise your right hand. Tomorrow night at seven o'clock, we don't know what's gonna happen. We don't know what we're gonna do, honest to God. If I knew, I'd tell you. Every time I come in thinking one thing, it ends up going somewhere else and I've, I just don't wanna get in the way. Whatever God wants is what we want. But tomorrow night could be the end and that would be all right too because it, it didn't start with man it starts with God and we have him living in us so everything's gonna be fine but we're not through until God's through with this revival this is his revival so raise your hand and receive this blessing now listen as you're leaving I would ask every one of you to sow seed into Perry's ministry and we're not going to take up offerings. We haven't taken up offerings. They're giving stations all over the church. There's ushers back there with little bags. You can give, but mostly and amazingly, people have been giving online. And that's the, that's the easiest way to do it. And don't forget about it. When you get to your car or wherever, if you think about it, even tomorrow, and the Lord lays something on your heart to sow into his ministry. What you give is going to go to Pam and Perry and their ministry, Voice of Evangelism. And, and you can trust us with that. And I'm going to tell you what you gave whenever this thing's over. And it's pretty remarkable. But it's for God's glory too. It's for God's glory too. And it's fulfilling prophecy. When this gospel, Matthew 24, is preached into all the world, then the end will come. And he's preaching the gospel around the world. We love him. Such an anointed vessel. Unusual. And I want to say one other thing. I know it's late. But those of you who don't know him and haven't known him, you may think he's a showman or whatever. There, there's no show about what you see is what you get all the time. I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. It's not unusual to be sitting out in a restaurant 
in Eaton, whatever, and all of a sudden you look over and Perry's over there going, and, and, and just, I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. He's been like this, Sharice, where she at? All our lives has he not been like, this is the same man, the exact Pat, my mother-in-law, same man, isn't it? He stayed in, in our home. We've known him for, for decades. This guy, and he, and he and I started in services just like this, where God got a hold of both of our hearts and others, so many others, so many others. Joel Talley, standing right there, a great pastor, great man of God. He is, 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 is just un, unreal, and there's no telling what God's doing. There's no telling. Might be raising up missionaries, nation changers, world changers, right on this stage. Raise your hand up now and receive this blessing. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. And may he give you peace in Jesus' mighty name. We'll see you tomorrow night at seven o'clock. I wanna say one more thing. I saw a video online that somebody sent me and people have been coming and praying even during the day, our music team. I saw Bill, the piano player. Bill, how old are you? How old is Bill? He's been with me. How old is Bill? 75 years old and I saw a video of him walking right up that aisle right there where those people are going all the way up to the top with his hands raised praying in the Holy Spirit walking up the aisles so when you come in this place every seat is being prayed over every aisle is being prayed over that's the key maybe you want to come and pray maybe you want to come early and and just pray and and just believe with us now we if you're a visitor don't get weird on us because we don't allow weirdness here we will sit you down and calm you down or whatever. We don't want weirdos. We want, we, want, we want the Holy Spirit. We don't want people drawing attention to themselves. But if you want to come pray, if it's all about Jesus, then it's in order. Amen. But not, not weirdos. This isn't a revival for that. We're not going to have that. It's all about Jesus. I love y'all. I'm so proud of y'all. I love you so much. I enjoyed partying with you tonight. That's what I feel like. I feel like I'm 15 again. And ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party. We're, we love you so much. We're, go get some candy. We love you. Bless you guys.